I stood in the middle of the icy street as frigid air and snow whipped around me. Many people would have thought that it was cold out, but and I didn't mind. Actually, I didn't feel any temperature at all. All I could feel was my father's gun in my back pocket and the weight of what was in my backpack. I positioned myself carefully as the school bus came speeding around the blind corner. My name is Sarah. I'm a junior in high school, and today is about to be the best day of my life. But for you to understand, I'll have to start this story at the beginning. My parents blamed me. They blamed me for everything. I was the reason my father lost his job, the reason our family was in a financial crisis. I was the reason my mother debated suicide each and every day, and the reason my father drank. I was the reason their marriage was falling apart. I was the reason that there was no joy left in this world. I was unwanted. I ruined their happy life by being born, as if I could have done anything. If given the choice, I would have rather never been born. I rarely ever went to school with my mother cowering from my dad, and my dad too drunk to do anything but take a swing at me if I got too close or did anything to draw attention to myself. I had to keep up the house. I had to buy food with the money I stole from my friends at school. It made me sick each and every time, but there was just no other way. My parents rarely left the house, my mother too hopelessly depressed, slowly poisoning herself each and every day with over-the-counter drugs, and my father only left to buy more alcohol with money I didn't dare go near. Not since last time. But none of this matters. I always considered myself strong. I tried so hard to get up each and every day and smile through my tears. I was actually very popular at school. The kids may have occasionally guessed that everything wasn't perfect, but they could never really know. I didn't complain, didn't ever break down and cry in front of anyone, nor vent my frustrations to someone who could never relate. Not once did I show any signs of breaking. It may have stayed this way. I may have been able to tough it out for two more years. If that boy hadn't been crossing the street that night. Or maybe that's not the reason. Maybe it was because my parents had finally both come together for back to school night shifting impatiently as my teachers applauded them for my straight A's, tapping their feet, caring less. Maybe it was because in that instant, I happened to be looking down at my feet. Maybe it was because the brakes were slightly worn in our car, or my father too drunk with a reaction time too slow. It doesn't really matter why, though. On our way home, that eight-year-old's body impacted the hood with such force that the aluminum buckled, the windshield splintering as his corpse tumbled like a broken rag doll down the street. He didn't even have time to see our car. My father, heavily intoxicated, began cursing and yelling while my mother somehow sat slumped in her seat, completely emotionless and uncaring. She never cared. How the hell could she not care? I shrieked and covered my mouth with disgust as blood ran down the shattered windshield. What have you done? I cried hysterically, hyperventilating. My father whirled around to face me, eyes burning like hot coals swaying in his seat. He was more drunk than I thought. Nothing, he grumbled, getting out of the driver's seat, throwing open my door and shoving me onto the cold pavement. You hear me? He yelled. Not a damn thing. My mother's eyes looked my direction, but didn't show any signs of intelligence as kick after kick met my stomach. She never did anything to stop it before. Why would she help me now? Grabbing my hair and yanking me to my feet, he pointed over to the mangled corpse. Hide it, he slurred, tone harsh and demanding. My eyes widened. No, I stammered. They couldn't be serious. Surely they knew this was murder. This is your fault, he screamed, shoving me towards it. This wouldn't have happened if we didn't have to go to your stupid school shit. After being told so many times that everything is your fault, you can't help but begin to believe it. The way they forced the guilt of killing an innocent child on me was absolutely sickening, but I believed every word. It was my fault, after all. Everyone would be happier if I wasn't around. The kid, whose corpse I waited and tossed to the bottom of a river that night, would still have been alive. That's for sure. I saw his face every night and every time I closed my eyes. The guilt was slowly killing me. I stopped going to school altogether, stopped eating, stopped trying to pretend that everything was okay. 
We used the last of our money to move as far as we could across town to avoid suspicion, but things at that new house only got worse. My parents just went on like nothing had ever happened, like a heartbroken mother wasn't crying in agony over a child deemed missing by the authorities. They just didn't care. But I felt all of it. All of the guilt, the pain, the sickening feeling every time a police car drove past. At first I was fine with this, I needed to be punished for what I had done, but soon. After countless sleepless nights of hugging myself tightly and trying to get the images of the accident out of my head, I began to think, no. I became plagued by this idea. Some deep down, long forgotten part of me had finally had enough. It wasn't my fault. That statement I had barely even considered before changed everything. I became obsessed with it. Every time I said it, I felt a little less depressed, but a little more angry. It wasn't my fault. This notion had been beaten and torn away from me from a very young age, but what they did to that poor boy made it start to rumble with the pent-up pressure of everything I had been blamed for in my entire life. This idea exploded outwards two weeks after we moved houses, and before I knew it, both my parents lay dead on the floor. A home-cooked meal laced with rat poison, sitting mostly untouched on the kitchen table. The idea had become so possessive, so controlling, that although I had never even considered the possibility of murder before, it all just happened. I barely even remember doing it. When I came to my senses and realized the magnitude of what I had done, however, I snapped. Their faces were horrible, sunken and bony with bulging, unblinking eyes, laying in the center of the living room where I had dragged them. I was suddenly claimed by the most surreal fear I had ever felt. What if they weren't dead? What if their horrifying, mangled faces started moving? Surely I just saw them blink! I'm sorry, Jesus Christ! I screamed through tears, running to grab a hammer. Please, dear God, I didn't mean to, I cried. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry! Kneeling next to them, I began smashing their faces with the hammer, cleaving skin off with each stroke. Don't hurt me, I yelled hysterically. You can't hurt me! You can't hurt me! I screamed over and over and jumped constantly as I could have sworn I saw a finger twitch or an inhale of breath. So I kept smashing and smashing harder and faster. It was several hours before I finally stopped, only because my arms were burning and utterly useless now. My parents' faces were strewn across the living room, where their heads once were now just sat mangled, unidentifiable chunky messes staining a large area of the carpet a deep crimson red. I sat next to their bodies, curling up and tucking my knees to my chest. I rocked back and forth slowly, still breathing heavy. What had I done? I looked down at the hammer in my hand, solid red with chunks of flesh still hanging on. Surely I couldn't report this as an accident to the police anymore. Then a groan. I scrambled to my feet in a panic. Who had made that sound? There was no one here but me and my parents, which meant... My chest tightened, sweat drenching me. <laughs> I laughed. Do you, do you guys want some dinner? I'll, I'll get some dinner for you. I needed to make them forgive me. I wasn't sure if they were really still alive or not, but... No, their, their heads were a pile of skull fragments. They had to be dead. But I couldn't convince myself. I kept hearing things, thinking I saw limbs move slightly. I cooked some peas in a bowl in the kitchen and brought it out to the living room for them. E eat up, I nervously chuckled. Vegetables are important for your health, your health. I set the bowl down and sat with them. Without any heads, I was able to imagine what they looked like and I imagined them smiling at me, their faces understanding and friendly. Then I imagined them looking at each other and laughing, love twinkling in their eyes. We were a happy family. They loved me and each other, and I loved them so much. My eyes welled up and a crooked grin formed on my face. I moved and, using all my strength, propped their bodies against the couch and then crawled to sit in between them. I grabbed the bowl of peas and offered them to each of my parents, my mom smiled and I said, No thank you, sweetie. You need the energy. You start at your new school next week, remember? I'm sure you'll make tons of new friends, I chimed in for my dad. That's right, I thought. A new school. A new life. I could make this all work. I could be happy. Feeling my eyes growing heavy, I slowly began drifting in and out of consciousness. Finally, I yawned and slowly dragged my parents into their room, hoisting them up onto their bed and then curling on the floor next to them. 
I had never slept better. The next week went by peacefully. I cooked meals for my parents three times a day, did laundry, cleaned the house, and when I wasn't preoccupied, I would sit on the bed with my parents and talk for hours. Their bodies quickly began to decay, skin turning six shades of green. The stench was horrendous, but I didn't mind. We were happy together. The meals I cooked for them began to pile up, sitting untouched next to them, spoiling and growing mold, decaying just like them. But I still didn't mind. They're just slow eaters, I would laugh to myself and pretend that they laughed with me. Finally, it was time for my first day of school. I woke up early, took a shower for the first time in weeks, and set out towards where I assumed the bus stop lay. It was a good 20 minute walk. When I arrived, I saw a boy my age standing with hands in his pockets, head down, looking at the ground. When he heard me walking, he looked up, his eyes meeting with mine. I stopped cold, my heart lurching in my chest. It had been so long since I had seen someone with an actual face, someone whose expressions I couldn't control. His eyes looked at me with an intelligence I couldn't fabricate back at home. It felt strange. Hi, he said nervously. Are you new here? I've never seen you at the stop before. I choked. Up until this point, all conversations had just been monologues in my head, but now I had to answer a question. I couldn't take my eyes off him. He occasionally made eye contact, but mostly shifted his eyes around nervously. Y yeah I squeaked. He looked at me and smiled. I'm John. If you're going to be taking the bus, I guess we'll be seeing each other a lot. Well, more like you'll have to put up with me, he laughed jokingly. I didn't laugh or even smile. My heart was racing. I could hear and feel my blood pumping as I swayed on my feet. What was this feeling I was experiencing? Things like laughter and real conversation seemed so foreign to me. He grew concerned when I didn't respond and took a step towards me. I, yeah, I was just joking, he said. I'm not really that annoying, I don't think. He gave another nervous laugh, his eyes searching my face. I took a step back. I could feel his gaze on me, and I could imagine him thinking about me. What did he think of me? I suddenly blushed, although I wasn't sure why, and dropped my gaze to the ground, my balance faltering. He slowly walked closer and now stood but a few feet from me, his hands hovering like he wanted to help me but was afraid to make contact. Are, are you okay? He said. You look terrified. I looked at him. Yeah, I... I just... I... I fumbled for words. He looked genuinely concerned about me, eyes intent, looking for a response. It felt... good. I'm fine, I said, fake smiling at him. He blushed and grinned, but didn't seem convinced of my answer. No, really, I said, finding myself giving a laugh. A real laugh. I'm just a little out of it today. <laughs> Seemingly more pleased with this, he allowed himself to relax, hands going back to his sides. <laughs> I know that feel, he chuckled. Frickin' Mondays, am I right? <laughs> yeah, I laughed, unable to keep a smile from spreading across my face. I hadn't felt this way in a very, very long time. Hey, where's your backpack, he questioned. Are you really planning on slacking off that much? I, I don't have one, I said slowly, looking at the ground. The grin disappeared from his face and he became worried again. R really he asked incredulously? Your parents didn't get you one? My blood froze and I clenched my fists. How the hell could he ask that? Was he saying they were bad parents? Maybe they never got me a damn backpack, but they loved me now. They loved me. We were a family now. He must have seen my son in anger because he backed up, waving his hands frantically. Whoa, sorry, he cried. Hey, I, I mean, if you need one, I can bring you one tomorrow. I have an extra. He smiled nervously. In fact, uh, why don't you use mine for today? The teachers know I'm a slacker, but you'll want to make a good first impression. I laughed, the anger somehow dissolving instantly. N no, I said, I'll be fine. Oh, come on, he said, swinging it off his back. Now I'll be offended if you don't take it. He held it out, looking at me hopefully. I just stared at it. Why did he care so much about me? I heard him sigh. Please, he asked, gently grabbing my hand and moving it to the backpack, waiting until I grasped it before letting go. My lip quivered and I smiled as tears began to roll down my face. I couldn't stop them. His hand was so warm, so real and alive. How long had it been since I had felt that? John looked like he had been shot. He backed up in a panic, eyes going wide and frantic. Whoa, 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 he screamed, waving his hands. Please don't cry. I'm, I'm a guy. I don't know how to handle this. I giggled as the tears continued to stream down. I'm, I'm sorry, I sniffled. I'm just a bit emotionally unstable right now. I gave him a joking smile as I wiped the tears from my eyes. This joke seemed to make him feel slightly better, but his hands still hovered, wanting to comfort me. And I wanted them to. 
Before I could think, I wrapped my arms around him. I wanted to hug something that hugged me back. He just stood there at first, unsure of what to do, but then slowly I could feel his hands on my back. Then, as I began to weep again, instead of backing up, he hugged me tighter. Uh, it's okay, he said, as more of a question than anything. Uh, I'm here for you or something? I laughed through my tears. Really? That's the best you got? Hey, he pouted. I'm trying my best here, dang it. That's when the bus horn sounded, making both me and him jump out of our skins. We whirled around to see that it had pulled up and was waiting right behind us. John's face turned bright red as he saw nearly every kid on the bus staring out the windows at us, laughing and whispering to each other. Damn it, he mumbled as the door squeaked open. The kids stared at me in awe as we walked down the aisle. Who is that? I heard someone whisper. I've never seen her before, another chimed in. Is she his girlfriend? I could have sworn I saw John wince at that. He slowed down in one open seat with another guy in it, who I assumed was his friend, but then after a quick glance back at me, John kept walking until he found a completely empty seat, sitting down and gesturing for me to do the same. He had chosen me over his friend. He barely knew me, and yet he was being so naively supportive. But what if he knew what I had done? My face grew dark. Surely he would hate me then. They would all hate me. My hands clenched. Then I felt a hand on my arm, and I instantly snapped out of my trance. It was John, tugging me into the seat. Come on, he pleaded. Quit your daydreaming. You're making this weirder than it has to be. His eyes shifted nervously to the kids around us, still staring at me. I nodded my head and sat down slowly. The seat was small, so we had to squish together. He clearly felt uncomfortable with me so close, and his eyes darted away any time I looked up at him. But I didn't care. That warm feeling had washed over me again. I could feel his heartbeat. Its strong pulse speeding up slightly whenever I pressed against him. I loved it. I imagined how awkward he must have felt, and I let out a little giggle. Hey, he grumbled, and just what is so darn funny? Nothing, I chuckled. I like you. You're funny when you're uncomfortable. Hey, hey he cried, blushing. I'm not uncomfortable, and if I am, it's only because you're so strange. Uh-huh, I sneered. What's that supposed to mean, he said, getting flustered, his heart speeding up. I just laughed harder. Huh, he sighed, turning away, frowning. You sure are weird. He tried to keep up a scowl, but I saw a slight grin peek through. Finally, the bus arrived at school. Do you know which homeroom teacher you have? He asked as everyone stood up and began filing out of the bus. Homeroom teacher? I echoed, perplexed. Geez, you're hopeless, he sighed. Uh, you didn't print out a schedule, did you? N no, I said slowly, becoming bewildered. W what do I do? Hey, whoa, don't worry, it's all good, he said assuringly. We can get it from the office, but we'll have to move fast, come on. He continued, grabbing my wrist and starting to run towards the school until he was suddenly stopped by the kid I saw earlier on the bus. What's this all about, then, the kid said, hands on his hips. You left me to die on the bus there. Hey, sorry about that, Max, John said. This is... uh... His face became confused. Then he turned to look at me. Hey, I never got your name, he stated. S sarah I choked out, face going red. Max looked agitated and opened his mouth to say something, but before he got a chance to speak, John cut him off. Sorry dude, I'll catch up with you later, we've got to get uh, Sarah's schedule right now. Then he started running towards the school, his hand gripping my wrist. I followed behind in a trance. My name. He said my name. That feeling welled up once again and my legs grew weak. I slowly grabbed his hand as he led me through the commons and into the office. I didn't want him to leave me. I needed to hold on to him, forever. He didn't seem to notice, or at least he didn't react to my hand closing around his, and as we reached the office and he let go of me, I reluctantly let my hand drop to my side, my heart beating like a jackhammer. Hello, he said to some lady sitting behind a desk, then he looked at me, gesturing to the desk with eyes saying, go ahead. I froze. Uh, uh, I stammered, stiff as a board. Schedule. I managed to croak out. John rolled his eyes and walked up to the counter. She forgot her schedule, he said. Could you please help us out? The lady nodded and turned to a computer. Name, she inquired. Uh, Sarah, he said. My heart skipped, my breath catching. He had said it again. Duffy, the lady asked, prompting John to turn and look at me for confirmation. My face bright red, I nodded my head extremely hastily, to the point where I'm sure I looked like an idiot. John smiled, rolling his eyes again, and then turning to nod at the lady. After printing out the schedule, we began walking to my homeroom. As we walked, he kept looking at me, smiling and shaking his head. What? I finally asked, trying to keep from blushing. Everyone around here is boring, he stated, but not you. There's something different about you. Is that... okay? I said quietly. He didn't hear me, and just kept walking. Of course not, I thought to myself. He hates you.
You're just so helpless that he feels like he needs to help. Come tomorrow, he won't even remember you. I gritted my teeth, my mind becoming cloudy, intrusive thoughts taking over. I can make him love me, though. If his face showed nothing but disgust towards me, I could change that. A smile began stretching the corners of my mouth. Yes, I could. I could imagine whatever face I wanted on his body if I just applied enough force. And then he could never leave me. Never forget about me. I really like that about you, he suddenly said. W what I stammered, all the thoughts exploding into vapor. I like how you're a little bit off, even if you're completely absent-minded 90% of the time, he chuckled, punching me lightly on the shoulder. I didn't even know what I had been thinking about before. All that mattered now was his face beaming at me, his words echoing in my head. I really like that about you. I felt a nearly crippling surge of feelings wash over me. I tried, I tried to hold back the tears, but my mouth became dry and my vision blurred as salty tears dripped down my face. I didn't want him to see me like this again, but as I looked, I realized he was busy looking at a sign. A32, right? He said, your homeroom? I quickly wiped the tears. Mm-hmm, I said, knowing that my voice would quaver if I talked. He turned to look at me and I quickly moved my hands to rub my eyes vigorously. Well, then we're here, he said, turning around. I've got to get to my room now, so I guess I'll see you later, Sarah. My hands fell to my side, and I nodded at him as he walked away. After standing for a good minute or two trying to calm down my frantic heart, I took a deep breath and slowly walked into the classroom. Everyone turned to look at me, stared at me. Why did everyone always stare? John never stared. I could see their faces of confusion, of judgment, and I hated them. I couldn't imagine them smiling or looking with understanding eyes because their real faces stared straight at me, burning through any illusions I created. Their real eyes weren't gentle either, not like John's. No, their eyes wanted something from me, trying to probe into my thoughts, scanning me up and down all at once. What if they could see what I had done? What? I wanted to scream. What the hell do you want? But I didn't. I wanted to stab out their stupid, cold, judgmental eyes with scissors, but I didn't. The thought of John was holding me back. I knew he would have comforted me right now. He would have told me to calm down and that everything would be alright. I slowly slunk away to the back of the classroom and sat down in the furthest back desk. The day dragged by slowly. Nobody talked to me, but I could feel their eyes on me constantly. Not that I wanted them to talk to me. John was all I could focus on anyway. I kept his backpack clutched close to me at all times and thought about him and I. We could sit together and talk. I could make meals for him. He could sleep with me and my parents, all of us, together, a family. Just the thought of it made me so happy that I wanted to curl up and hug myself, hold on to this warm feeling forever. The end of the day bell finally rang and I sprinted outside to the bus. I would wait for him here. Wait for him for as long as it took. I ran through possible conversations in my head. How was your day today? Did you think of me? Do you want to come over to my house? Stay forever? I slapped myself. No, I couldn't let these delusional thoughts get the best of me. I would keep it simple. Yeah, we would be together eventually. Sarah? John was walking towards me, carrying some books and papers, which I assumed he would have put in his backpack if I hadn't been using it. I beamed with pride. I ran to him, holding it out to him. Here, I giggled. There's still plenty of room. Hey, thanks, he said, placing his stuff inside. And how was the first day? Boring, I said, probably a little too cheerfully. Yeah, but take comfort in the fact that it only gets harder from here, he laughed sarcastically. Make any friends, he questioned. I don't need anyone but you, I blurted out before frantically covering my mouth with my hands. His eyes widened and I saw a flicker of fear, but they quickly softened and he started laughing. Very funny, he grinned. I understand I'm not the coolest kid at school. No need to be a dick about it. Ha, <laughs> sorry, I forced laughed, but... John was the coolest kid. There was no one even close, so kind and caring, so naive, seeing the good in everyone. Even me. The whole bus ride home, we talked about our teachers and which ones were the worst. I laughed and pretended to agree, but in reality I didn't even remember any of my teachers. I just sat in the back of my classes and doodled all day. Pictures of me and John, holding hands, hugging, smiling. The bus eventually reached our stop and we got off. It was snowing outside and it was cold. Well, my house is this way, John said. I guess I'll see you tomorrow then? I nodded solemnly. The snowflakes fell lightly around us, blanketing the frozen ground. I didn't want him to go. If only there was some way I could be with him at all times. Hey, why don't you just hold on to this backpack, John said, grabbing his stuff out of the pack. I'll just use my extra one. It's a little more bulky, but I have more books anyway. I smiled, nodding my head slowly. He was thinking about me again. 
It made my heart pound and my stomach slightly queasy. Well, see you later then, he cheered, turning around and walking away. I stood for a long while, watching him leave, the snow crunching as he walked. Then I suddenly thought of my parents. They must have been hungry by now.